Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and this is the APOS and Audio Technica ATH R70X Refine. This is a 300 US dollar open back high impedance dynamic driver headphone that is a, col a collaborative modification to Audio Technica's well known and well respected ATH R70X. APOS sent this over for review. They have asked nothing in return other than a fair and honest evaluation and an affiliate link, which I will provide down in the description. So if you like what I have to say about this product and uh, want to help support the channel, please use that affiliate link and I will get a small kickback. But I only use affiliate link money to go back into the channel to keep things running around here. All right, I have a couple of other notes on this one that I should get out here um, real quick. I have another disclaimer where I got a chance to listen to a prototype of this, um, which I will talk about on the other side of shameless self-promotion. Okay. And you should also keep in mind that this is going to be a limited edition. There will only be 1,000 units of this made, and it will ship over four batches starting in October of 2024 and running through May of 2025. So one of the uh, buying decisions that are, are part of the calculus to make a buying decision for this headphone is going to come down to how long it may take for you to get it on your head. So that's uh, something that we will explore in this video as well. But I will say that I actually like the sound of this headphone quite a bit. I think it fits into the market well and is a solid option, particularly for tube amp aficionados here around 300 US dollars. Um, but I have one complaint about its cabling system that I don't think will be a deal breaker for many, but I found it to be a little bit annoying. So we will unpack all of that on the other side of shameless self-promotion. Here we go. Hello. I'm one of the reasons that Wave Theory can't spend all of his money on audio gear. He wants you to know that your support is vital for keeping the channel running. So if you enjoy Wave Theory's Bussin review riz and no cap review style and want to encourage him to stay in the basement so I don't have to listen to his dad jokes as much, like the video and subscribe to the channel. You can also send him a donation on PayPal or sign up for the Patreon. Links are in the description. Now on to the review. This is going to be another fairly long review because there's a lot of ground to cover here and I really want to help anyone out there who is a potential buyer of the R70X Refine uh, make an informed decision as to whether or not it's worth risking a wait of up to, let's see, how far away is May 2025 here? So the launch date's going to be August 13th, which is the day this video will release of 2024. And so if you're waiting until May 2025, like, do you want to wait? What is that? Eight months ish around there, eight to nine months uh, to get your headphone. OK, um, that's going to be your call. Right. And so like, I'm going to be as thorough as I can be uh, to help anyone who's in that situation, um, you know, understand if they want to wait that long or make the decision if they want to wait that long or not to get this. Because in terms of, is this a good sounding headphone at 300 US dollars? Yes, I think so. Um, is it fairly priced there? Yes, it is. I think it is a good alternative. Um, if you have some issues with some of the popular high impedance dynamic driver headphones out there, um, this is a good alternative. It is different different enough from like the, the Sennheiser HD 600 and 650, the Bayer Dynamic DT series, okay, um, and so forth, that it can stand on its own, both in terms of having its own unique sound and um, in the price performance category there at 300 US dollars. So part um, and it's just going to be then about the weight, I think, for a lot of people. Um, so in this review, I'm going to go over, of course, the performance of this headphone on its own. I'm gonna talk about like the one big complaint I have about it, and that is the cabling system. And then we'll also, I will do an in-depth comparison of this one to the Masterop Sennheiser HD 6XX, the Bayer Dynamic DT880, the uh, Hi-Fi Men Sundara, and because it's been slashed in price so much, the Hi-Fi Men Edition XS. Should you consider this 
um, over any of those? And I think the answer to all of that is yes for certain users, and we'll unpack that in the course of the comparisons there too. But the first thing that I need to come back to, oh, and I say all of that to say that there's a lot to talk about here. I will timestamp this video out, jump around as you need to. Okay, I should come back to the second disclaimer that I mentioned here um, at the top of the video. So, Audio Technica and APOS sent me this production unit. So this is one of the production units as far as I know. Um, they initially sent me a prototype about a month before they sent me this one. And the prototype, to my ear and to my recollection, sounded identical to this one. It just didn't have the styling on it, like this uh, little nameplate here on the back of it was a little bit different. But it was otherwise the same as far as I know. And the reason they sent me that prototype ahead of time is they um, asked me explicitly, like, just listen to this and let us know if our engineers missed anything major in the sound. And they didn't. Okay, um, and so I sent this back and said, yeah, I think it's ready to go. I don't hear any glaring issues that are standing out for 300 bucks. Um, so it, no, I don't think you missed anything. So they said, okay, great. We'll send you a production unit then for a full review. Okay, and that really came, um, you know, within a week or so after I had listened to that prototype. So like if I had given any um, thing, any uh, areas where they needed to change or anything, any feedback that they needed to actively do something with, there wouldn't have been enough time in there. So, so um, the, this review that you're going to hear are sonic impressions from a prototype and then the production unit, which as far as I know, were basically identical except for styling. Okay. Uh, so I just say that to get it out there that like this is not a wave theory tuned edition or anything like that. It's still all APOS and Audio Technica. It's just that they asked me to give a listen and like just let them know if they had missed anything critical before time, uh, before um, the hard launch and all of that. And so the, take that for what it is. There's my disclaimer that you have knowledge about what's going on here. Okay. So with that, let's get into the headphone itself. Specs on this thing, I mentioned at the top, this is a high impedance headphone. It has a 45 millimeter dynamic driver in it. Its rated impedance is 470 ohms with a rated sensitivity of 98 decibels per milliwatt. The 470 ohms is definitely in high impedance territory and that should perk up the ears of output transformerless or OTL tube amp aficionados. So things like the Dark Voice or the uh, Felix Echo or the Bottlehead Crack or let's see, well, um, there's a couple of X duos out there now, like the TA66 being one of them, um, that are output, output transformerless vacuum tube amplifiers. High impedance headphones like this are good options for that kind of amplifier because that kind of amplifier naturally has a high output impedance. And so having high impedance here means that the damping factor stays up where it's supposed to be. And I have a video where I explain output impedance and damping factor, which I will link to you down in the description below. So anyway, this enters into a space then that is not all that crowded anymore in terms of like say budget enthusiast tier high impedance headphones. And so anyone who has a, one of those vacuum tube amps like I said uh, previously will want to pay attention to this. I will drop here though that this headphone does not transform when you go from solid state amp to vacuum tube amp like an HD600 or an HD650 slash 6XX will do, but the high impedance does mean that if you have one of those vacuum tube amps that you like, no problem running this on there. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and we'll switch to an overhead view where I will show you the build of this headphone and we'll also talk about the stock cable, which I don't love, okay, um, and I don't love the cabling system in general, and I will do a thorough job of explaining why, but I will reiterate here that the, uh, the R70X, the original R70X from Audio-Technica was cabled the same way, as far as I know. Um, and I should also say, I have not had the privilege of hearing the R70X, so that's going to be one absent thing from my uh, comparisons. 
They are trying to get me one, and they may still get one to me, in which case I will review that one and then give it a comparison to this when and if that's, that happens. But um, the cabling system on this is a bit of an irritant for me, and I think it will be for some, but I don't know that it's going to be a deal breaker for many. Again, the original R70X was out there with the same cabling system, and people still like and use that headphone. So I will give my thoughts for what they're worth, and then you can make your decision uh, from there, from my input and the input of other reviewers, hopefully, too. Hopefully, you're not taking just my word for things. All right, so let's go ahead and cut to that view and talk about the build and the cabling and the comfort and all of that. Here we go. Overhead view to take a look at the build of the headphone and the cable. The headphone is, I mean, it's fairly sharp looking with the, the blacks or gray here and then the goldish colored grill material here. And then of course we have the audio, come on, focus camera, Audio Technica and APOS branding on their ATH R70X Refine. I don't know if that ever really became clear. Sorry about that. Technical limitations. Anyway, um, it's also, it's very light. Okay, I put it on my little postal scale and verified the website's claims that it's 7.4 ounces in weight, and that translates to 210 grams of mass. Okay, it is very light. And then also the headband system, is like the OG, but it is kind of nifty with like this spring steel. I think that's what this is up here. But then like no actual headband. We just have these spring loaded, um, I don't know, wings or whatever here with pads on them that go on your head here. And like that's also the size adjustment. Like these are naturally going to fit on your head. Okay. And like conform to your head size and head shape there. So like you know, there's no, there's no extension here or anything. This is all one size here, and it's just in how much this flexes as to how it fits on your head. The pads are super soft. I think they're a velour material. Okay, the ear opening is not super big, but it's also not tiny. Um, so there might be some parts of your ear that it pushes on, but it's such a soft, supple pad here. Uh, I really had no comfort issues with this whatsoever. The, the, just the way it kind of, it conforms to the head here and then the, you know, the, the lightness of it and then the softness of the pads. It's very, a very comfortable headphone to wear for long periods of time. I did not have any comfort issues at all. And in fact, I would say comfort is one of its strengths. One complaint I do have about the build here is this kind of thin, material this material here that holds the pad onto the the headphone here just seems kind of chintzy and flimsy to me and i have a little bit of longevity concern with that i don't know if that will be a big issue we'll have to see over the life of the headphone it is entirely possible that that's the same way the original r70x is done and if so, I have not heard a whole lot of pad failure issues on it, but that is one thing that I will be watching for over the long term. It's just that material right there just feels a little bit on the cheap side. Now, you also notice that it doesn't necessarily stay symmetrically in place either okay, around the perimeter of the cup there. So that's uh, another thing to keep in mind that might, may or may not be a concern to you. Uh, and all of that. Okay, let's talk about the cable. This is about a, I think it's approximately a two meter long, or is it 1.5? Let's see. It's got to be two, okay? Um, this is the stock cable single-ended. You can see I had it coiled up there. I will coil it around my hand again and just show you this on camera. And then when you go to set this down, it kind of unwinds on itself a little bit there. So it has a little bit of memory to it, okay? Um, but, you know, it doesn't really tangle up on itself very much, although, yeah, see, there we go. Will it do that every time? Probably not. Amp end is a threaded quarter inch or 6.35 millimeter adapter over a single ended 3.5 millimeter or eighth inch plug, okay? Like so. And then the headphone end is a dual 2.5 millimeter TRS plugs, but 
They are locking. Okay. Um, as far as I know, the original OG or the yeah the original OG that was from the Department of Redundancy Department. The original R70X also used this same connector system. So that's just a thing that Apos chose not to change. I would have um, for a few reasons. Let, let's talk about this cable here. So I already showed you like the kind of the stiffness to it and the memory of it. So it's not the best feeling cable in the world. Also observe, and this really threw me at first until I asked my rep about it, and then he's like, it's on the website, you dummy. He didn't actually call me a dummy, but he may as well have, because on the website, it does say that you can plug this into the headphone in either direction, and it will work just fine. And that is true. So there, be ready for this. If you buy one of these, like I stared at this stupidly forever, trying to figure out what was going on until I just tried to plug it in. There are no right or left indicators on either plug at all. Okay. And that again, like, because you can plug it in either way and it will work. You will get right on right, left on left, regardless of what you do. How did they do that? And is that actually an advantage? Here's how I'm pretty sure they did it. I just sketched it out because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Okay. So here we go. The amp end, TRS, tip, ring, sleeve. Okay. Both plugs here on these things, TRS, tip, ring, sleeve. What I believe they have done here, and I have inquiries to confirm this, if they, is they have wired both of these, okay, tips to tip, rings, meaning this middle part right here in the middle, okay, rings to rings, and then sleeves to sleeve, okay, that's how I think they did it. So that's what these black paths are here on my little diagram. And then the headphone itself has to be wired somehow such that one side probably goes tip to tip and the uh, and sleeve to sleeve and then the other side goes ring to ring and then sleeve to sleeve. So uh, what does all of this mean? What am I getting at here? Um, my biggest complaint about this headphone is this stinking cable. Okay, and just the overall cabling system. Here are my issues with it. Okay, the plugs are reversible insofar as you can, you know, plug either into right or left, and it doesn't matter. It's going to work just fine. Okay, that's cool, but I don't care. I don't necessarily see the advantage to that. I can understand if the argument was, well, that just makes it really convenient. You never have to worry about which way you go, so it makes it really easy. Well, okay, if that makes connecting it easy, then why did you use locking connectors? Okay, because to me, all of that easiness is canceled out by the fact that now you have to like look at that notch there, and then you have to find the corresponding notch on here and like there, okay? Did you see it? Like, you can't just plug this in any old way, right? You have to line this up specifically with this notch here on the plug, with this notch on the headphone, then that will slide in and then you have to twist it to lock it in place and now it will stay, okay? So to me, that is no faster, no, no more convenient than just having one side clearly labeled R and the other side clearly labeled L. So whatever convenience they went for on that to me is just completely canceled out by the use of locking connectors, okay? It takes just as much time to get that figured out. Okay, that's problem one that I have here. Problem number two, to do it that way means you have to use a single-ended cable, at least in stock form. Why? Because you can't do this, okay? You can't do this with a balanced cable. A balanced cable, if you buy an aftermarket balanced cable for this, it's gonna have to be clearly labeled R and L because a single ended cable shares the return channel, uh, okay, AKA the sleeve here. But if you try to share the return on a balanced connection, then you connect two separate amplifiers together that aren't supposed to be together and bad things happen. 
okay? So like that, so you can only do that with the single ended cable, okay? That brings me to kind of a, another point here. That's kind of like two points in one. <clears throat> First, you have to buy an aftermarket cable if you want to plug this into a, a balanced amp of any kind. Now that's not rare in headphones, but you need to like factor in the cost of that if you're going to do it. Um, I looked up Heart Audio Cables and Audiophile Ninja. Both of them have an option between about $70 and $80 to get a balanced cable for this headphone. Okay, so I mean that that option is out there. Um, why does that matter? Well, at 470 ohms of impedance like this headphone has, it really requires desktop amp kind of power. Sure, some portable devices can handle it okay. The efficiency isn't bad at 98 decibel per milliwatt, but more or more often than not, you're going to want desktop amp level power to drive this headphone. A lot of desktop amps that are priced in the price range where this is appropriate to match to it now have balanced headphone outputs too. Not every single one of them, but a growing number do. All right, and so like it's you're incurring extra cost to be able to use this headphone with those amps. Okay, those balanced output amps down around this price. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Like, um, I mean, like Fio and a couple of other companies and all that with their headphones are like putting interchangeable plugs on these and you can use it balanced from the stock cable. I think that really helps the value. I would have liked to have seen something like that. Problem number two. Think about this. There has to be six electrical pathways in this single ended cable, okay, to wire up the tips to the tip, the rings to the ring, and the sleeves to the sleeve. That's six. But each driver here only needs two electrical runs to it, a plot, what we call a plus and a minus, okay, which with alternating current plus and minus, they, you know, they're they flip all the time. They spend an equal amount of time per second being the plus and the minus. But the point is you need two runs, which means you only need four electrical pathways. So this cable, as thin as it already is, has to have six electrical pathways in it, but then at any given time only uses four. Okay, so I'm just having I, I'm just having difficulty wrapping my head around why do it this way? Why do it this way? And I've asked that question um, to APOS who said they were going to kick it on, on to uh, Audio Technica to find out like what's the reasoning for all of that. Um, because again, if it comes down to convenience, I think the use of the locking connectors cancels out the convenience and then why have six conductors in this already like fairly high gauge cable and then only use four of them? I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Okay. Um, that is my biggest complaint about the R70X or fine though, is just that cabling system. And my rant about that is now done. Okay. We're going to switch to sound here in just a moment, and that is where this thing really takes off because this is really a very fine sounding headphone um, and so forth. So, yeah, let's go ahead and cut to me back on camera talking about that. As we turn our attention towards sound, let me list some of the test gear that I used to do this review. I tried to use a range of products here uh, for source gear just to kind of get an idea of where this fits in with the market and also just test different amps and see like different kinds of amp combos and all of that that work for it. So because it's high impedance, I did break out my KNHA 1A Mark II tube amp. That is not an OTL amp. It is an output transformer coupled amplifier. I have a review for it, which I will put a link down in the description for. Um, 
Um, however, that amplifier has a variable output impedance, so I could get it to somewhat simulate what an OTL amp would do by jacking up that head, that uh, output impedance quite a bit. So that's the tube amp that I used to try the refine on. Okay, I also used a couple of entry level solid state DAC amps to uh, get an idea of like how drivable this is with entry level gear and just see how it responded to them. One is the uh, Shit Magni Unity, which I have a review for with its internal ESS DAC module. So link in the description for that review. And the other one is a piece that I have in for review and have not yet published a review, but hope to do so in the near future. That is the FIO K11R2R here. Um, and I show you this one because this kind of harkens back to the cabling issue that I talked about um, in the, uh, well, where I went on that long rant about the cabling. This one's got a quarter inch, okay, or 6.35 millimeter single-ended headphone output, and then a 4.4 millimeter Pentacon balanced output on it. You look at the specs of this thing, and my ears bear this out too, is that the Pentacon output has far more power output than the single-ended output. For a headphone that is 470 ohms, that matters, and then that comes back to the cabling issue that I discussed. I was able to get around that somewhat by using one of these DD Hi-Fi. Uh, this is the model DJ30A. Okay, but this is a 4.4 millimeter Pentacon to 3.5 millimeter single-ended adapter. iFi makes a similar product. I can link to both on here. What these do is for most 4.4 millimeter Pentacon outputs, they can simulate um, a balanced connection. It's still single-ended if you plug this in here, okay, and then plug the headphone in there but it does allow you to take advantage of the higher output power of most 4.4 millimeter Pentacon outputs. Do be careful, you cannot plug these into just anything. Okay, when in doubt, ask the maker of your, your piece there to, uh, to be sure. But I point that out to say that I have a couple of amps, or I used a couple of amps to check this headphone, the R70X, that, are, that have those Pentacon outputs, so I could at least get the higher output power. And uh, the K11R2R was one of them. We'll I'll come back to amplifier pairings in just a moment where I flesh that out a little bit further. Uh, a couple of mid-fi amplifiers that I use, Lake People G111 Mark II and the Aoun S17 Pro. Okay, a review for the latter is in the works. A review for the former was published long ago and I will link to it down below. Um, and then I also did like a shoot the moon signal chain on this. Well, I should say that um, I, uh, uh, for a good chunk of the time, I used the Gishelli Labs J2S uh, DAC with the Sparkos, I believe it's 2502 op amps in it, um, which was fed by an Allo USB signature streamer, which was connected to my Rune network. Okay, that would have, uh, that little rig would have fed both the S17 Pro and the G111 Mark II. Okay, I used the 4.4 millimeter output with this adapter on the uh, S17 Pro, and then the uh, uh, G111 conveniently has quarter inch outputs already because it's a single ended amp. Okay, um, use those. And then I also like to check how well this scaled up. I went all the way into like a crazy high end uh, signal chain that was my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 into a Nimbus US5, HPA US5 headphone amp. And then the Berkeley was also fed by Singer SU6 uh, from a Sonor, Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer, just again, see how well this would scale up to a really ridiculously high uh, price signal chain. Okay, and we'll get to all of that here in due time. Music files would have been lossless or high resolution FLAC files um, or DSD files. The FLAC files would have been either played locally via Rune or streamed um, by, from Cobas via Rune or local DSD files played through Rune. Okay. Let's first talk then about driving the ATH uh, R70X Refine here. You do need mostly desktop amp level power. I don't think there are going to be very many portable amps, particularly dongles 
or those flask type um, DAC amps out there that are going to have sufficient power to really make this sing. Um, you don't need a crazy amount of power. Like the Shit Magni Unity drove this just fine. The single ended output of the K11 R2R struggled with it a little bit, but the balanced output handled it just fine as well. Um, so I think most portable gear is going to struggle with this, particularly uh, portable gear that's going to be, you know, under 500 bucks, like what I would imagine people who buy a $300 headphone would be um, willing to pair this with. But as long as you get to any kind of decently powerful desktop amplifier, I think you're going to be fine. Okay, it's also here where I'll mention again, this headphone does not really transform when you go from solid state to tube amps um, in the way that a Sennheiser HD600 or HD650 slash HD6XX is going to do. I found that the sonic character of this headphone was pretty much the same if it was on the Shit Magni Unity or the K11 R2R or the Lake People G111 as it was when I moved to the knha one a Mark II. Whereas like my 6XX, you can hear it wake up a little bit more on the KN tube than it does on particularly those lower cost solid state amps um, and all of that. So if you are wanting a headphone that just absolutely transforms going solid state to tube, this is not it, but it is a good match to a lot of tube amplifiers out there, which just means that if you like the sound that a tube amp gives you, if you like the distortion profile and like where it lands on the wet dry spectrum and all of that kind of uh, stuff, then and the HD 600 series headphones just don't work for you for whatever reason, or the buyer dynamic high Z's don't work for you for whatever reason, this is different enough to like make those a viable option and work with tube amps again. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the sound. The perceived frequency response and tonality of the R70X refined, and you know what, I'll just go ahead and stick it on my head so you can see it here. I found to be still in the range of neutral, but leaning warm. So it has a slightly warm tilt to it. And I am not 100% sure if that warmth comes from a perceived elevation in the mid bass frequencies or if it's from a roll off in the top end and air frequencies a little bit because I got the impression that the upper ranges of the treble were pulled back just a little bit. There's still good treble extension, it's just the presence of it. The amount of treble seems to be just slightly below what true neutral might be. Okay, so whether again it's a slight boost in the upper bass, lower mids, or or a, or a roll off in the treble or both, it comes across to me as being a little bit neutral warm. All right, um, but that said, there is excellent tonal balance, um, particularly through the bass in the mid range. I found the relationships between fundamental frequencies and their harmonics through the bass and the mids to be pretty accurate and uh, realistic, frank frankly, okay? Um, so, Vocals and mid-range instruments have pretty good tam timbre. I did not notice any shout or honk or anything like that through the mids here, and I thought the bass too was also well present, well extended, well balanced, and well textured. The treble is the relative weak point of the three main categories of the frequency spectrum, meaning bass, mid-range, treble. Okay, so in the upper frequencies, the tonal balance is not as strong as it is in the mids or the treble. So the, the cymbal crashes can get a little bit tizzy. You can get a little bit of sibilance when a vocalist says some S's and some T's and that sort of thing, but it is not out of line for a $300 headphone. So it's there, it, the, the treble tonality and tonal balance, not as strong as the mids and the bass, but still very much in line for what we can expect from a $300 headphone. All right, other presentational things uh, in here, like the sound stage is big, but it is not huge or cavernous. Um, so it didn't really stand out to me. Like when I heard it, it's definitely wider and bigger than the Sen HD 600 series, but it doesn't quite catch like what Bayer Dynamic or, or uh, Hi-Fi Min is doing at the similar price in terms of soundstage size. There is decent depth for the price here. So they got some sense of like uh, layering and depth 
in the sound staging, which is good. Um, not super standout for the price, but it was noticeable. It was there, so there was not like a wall of sound kind of feeling. That can happen at this price, but this manages to effectively avoid that. Dynamics are also decent, but not super standout. Like there is a reasonable amount of punch and slam and physicality, particularly in the low end. Um, but you get into the mids and the treble and there's not quite as much snappiness um, or, or speed on the attack and the decay as I have heard from some other headphones around this price, but it's also not poor in that regard. So it's just like dynamics. I would call like basically average though, maybe slightly above average though, not like super outstanding impact in the bass and the sub bass. Um, Additionally, on the, the, the spatial presentation, the imaging and the separation are also pretty solid. There's a pretty good sense of where sounds are, particularly laterally. So that's the imaging stuff, where are sounds. And then the separation, where are sounds not, in other words, space between sonic images, it, particularly in the lateral direction, is also fairly strong and reasonably good for the price. I also found this headphone to be quite a music genre generalist. It played nice with a wide variety of uh, music genres. I am mostly like a rock and metal kind of listener and then some pop and hip hop and EDM and classical works its way in there, like classical and orchestral soundtrack kind of things works its way in there with a little bit of jazz here and there as well. Like I like the way I like to listen, particularly in the acclimation phase, is like I have a massive playlist that's like getting close to 4,000 tracks now that I just shuffle in Rune. And so just a lot of stuff comes through here and I did not notice a huge change in performance with this headphone when it goes from like a heavy metal track to like a contemporary pop track to um, you know a, a pipe organ piece to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or something like that right like it it performed well across the board with a lot of genres of music so it's very much a music genre generalist which I think is good okay um, also like for poorly recorded tracks, it doesn't freak out too much. It, it has the resolution chops and that sort of thing to point out if a track is poorly recorded. It doesn't freak out and shriek or present those flaws in an aggressive way. So that still makes it like a nice listen, right? So the combination of the slightly warm signature the fact that it's a music genre gen a generalist, the resolution being good but not overly aggressive, and then the grace that it shows with poorly recorded tracks means, and then of course the physical comfort, like you put all of that together and what you get for me anyway, is a headphone that you can just plug in and listen to for an extended period of time and not get fatigued not have neck cramps, not really have hot spots on your head or anything like that. So it's a good kick back and listen for a long time or keep it on during the work day and listen as you work kind of headphone. Now let me talk about amp pairings real quick. Okay, because I, uh, I again, I listened to a variety of amps in there and I will say that like, again, solid state, and tube amp, I did not hear a huge transformation in there. Um, they all sounded good. The K11 R2R here might be the one that struggled the most to drive this, and that's like on this particular amp, even from the balanced output, is where I had the most sibilance issues with this headphone. So I think the K11 R2R is like kind of the floor in terms of like representing amplifier, the combination of amplifier power and quality that you want to try this, this headphone with. It's like the shit Magni Unity was a little bit smoother, not because the Magni Unity is necessarily a better sounding DAC amp, it might be, I just haven't gotten to that point yet, but I think it has a little bit more power and control in its amplifier, which helped with the high impedance load here. The Aoun S17 Pro is the one amp that I listened to all here that like it was competent with this, but I just didn't think it was a good synergistic match. 
the power was there, the control was there, the staging and all of that. For me, the Aoun S17 Pro is a warm amp, right? Like it might be beyond what's considered neutral and is just straight up warm. Like it's not neutral warm, it's just warm. Review on that pending. And so you combine that with the warmer tilt of this headphone and for me, it just got to be a little bit too warm and too thick. I really preferred this headphone on the G111, which is a more neutrally tuned amplifier than the, the S17 Pro is, okay? This is not to say that the S17 Pro is not a good amp. I can hear some people starting to collectively freak out already. I do think the S17 Pro is a very good amplifier for its price. Review on that pending. I'm just saying that the warm signature of that plus the warm signature of this doubled down on the warmth and just became a little bit too much for my liking. Some of you may like that double dip of warmth and thickness. Others will not. I'm just letting you know that happens and that Generally speaking, I think you may want to go towards more neutrally tuned amps for this headphone because, again, the double down on warmth can become too much at times. That was just my thoughts on pairing this with amplifiers. Okay. With that, I think we can cut to um, my comparisons with the DT880, the HD6XX, the Sundara, and the Edition XS. And I'll remind you again, if you haven't heard yet, I do have not had the privilege of hearing the original R70X yet. I hope to soon. APOS and Audio-Technica are trying to get me one. If one does show up, I will give it its own review and then do a comparison to its mod here um, and uh, publish that at a later time. But for now, Let's take a look at those other comparisons. All right, why the Sundara as a point of comparison? Well, it is a planar magnetic headphone, so that's fundamentally different than the dynamic driver of the Refine. Um, to a point, the Sundara is about 280 US dollars right now, so it's very close in price. Uh, here and the Sundara is like kind of widely regarded as as like one of the, the the best technical performers and also just very enjoyable headphone there at you know just shy of 300 US dollars and what I found here was pretty interesting the R70X Refine on a technical level so when you talk about things like resolution the holography of the spatial presentation timbre those kinds of things is I think right in the same ballpark with the Sundara. So on a technical level, very, very close right here. They are very close in resolution. They are very close in the three-dimensionality of the soundstage and, uh, and of, of the spatial presentation and all of that. They have slightly different takes on timbre, but they're both good. Okay, uh, the R70X is just a little bit, I mean, as I've said earlier, it's warmer and fuller sounding, maybe just a little bit thicker sounding, whereas the Sundara is kind of like a neutral, just slightly bright, um, not real bad on that brightness, but just it's definitely brighter in its tone than the Refine is. So the Sundara's timbre sounds just a little bit higher pitched and just a little bit like, uh, thinner, just slightly. Okay, so it just has a little bit overall brighter kind of tone and timbre to it. This one, again, just a little bit warmer and thicker. Both very good, both reasonably accurate in their timbre, just a little bit different, slightly different um, flavor. So that, I think, though, says speaks volumes to the R70X and like how well engineered of a headphone it was that it is competing with one of the industry leaders at the price point on a technical level. All right, so there is a quick comparison with the, well, let me say a couple more things about it. The R70X is also going to be a little bit harder hitting in the low end, just give you a little bit more slam and rumble than the Sundara is. The Sundara is still very well um, extended in the bass. It just doesn't have the impact or the presence that the Refine brings down low. Another presentational difference, though, is the Sundara just still makes everything sound bigger. The soundstage is not markedly bigger. Like, this does not have the grandiosity of, like, Hi Feynman's egg-shaped um, offerings in terms of soundstage. But the planar magnetic driver in here has bigger surface area than I think it's a 45 millimeter dynamic driver in here. So even the individual sounds of the, uh, the 
the Sundara. So like if you picture being at an orchestral performance and you've got the, you know, this, this orchestra out in front of you, the soundstage sounds pretty, pretty close in size between the two, but the individual instruments or voices or whatever just sound a little bit bigger with the Sundara than they do the, uh, the Refine. Neither one, I'm not saying either one is really right or wrong on that. I'm just saying that's a, a presentational difference, which I think comes down to the fact that this one is planar and has more driver radiating area than the dynamic driver of the Refine does. And that's one way that that sound difference comes out. All right, a bit more like for like comparison here is the Refine versus the Mastrop Sennheiser HD 6XX which for those who have been living under a rock is essentially a Sennheiser HD 650 with a little bit different color scheme and a little bit different padding on the headband. Um, and that's about it really, okay? This one currently is about, it's listed at 219 US dollars, but as of the filming, it is on sale for 199 US dollars. This is a legendary headphone. Uh, many people know about it, know what it sounds like and all of that. They're familiar with its kind of neutral warm kind of tuning that it's a little bit more intimate in its sound staging and it's got that like kind of three blob spatial presentation where it sounds like there's information left, information right, information center, but not a whole lot left center or left right um, in there. Okay, but oh the magical mid-range on this headphone. It just still has some of the smoothest, most organic sounding mid-range you're gonna get anywhere near its price and well beyond its price. Okay, um, and that is really the true strength of this headphone um, in addition to it being a very like smooth and relaxed kind of presentation that you can listen to for hours and hours. So that's just a quick reminder about what's going on with this one. How does the Refine compare to it? They both have a warmer tilt in their overall tonality, right? So they, I mean, they both come across as just warm. Now, the Refine has more treble presence than the 6XX does. So if you find the 6XX too dark or it's not airy enough, but you like a warmer sound, then the R70X really becomes a good option because it does bring a lot of the warmth that the 6XX slash 650 does, but without sacrificing as much on the top end. So it's a more like, and, and thus it also sounds like open, more open and more airy in its presentation and that sort of thing. The Refine is better at sound staging, imaging, separation, spatial stuff too. It's wider and bigger in its sound stage. It does not really suffer from the three blob spatial presentation that the 6XX does. There's very good coherence, particularly left to right, okay, um, on the sound stage and the spatial presentation there, okay, on the R70X that is not on the, the 6XX there either. The 6XX, however, has a little bit more bass impact and like punch and slam and that sort of thing than the Refine does. The Refine has a good amount of that stuff, okay? It is not at all devoid of impact. The 6XX just has more, okay? Um, another thing that the 6XX is known for is its ability to scale up. Okay, uh, in terms of like if you put it on more and more expensive source gear like amps, DACs, streamers, etc., it just keeps giving you more and more. Like where is its performer performance ceiling? It seems to elevate its performance with elevated source gear way, way beyond what could fairly be expected from a $200 headphone. The Refine scales up some, but not as much. Okay. Uh, a $10,000 signal chain, actually more than that, that I tried both of these on. Um, my Berkeley Alpha Series 2, fed by the Singer SU6 um, DDC and a Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer, and then the, the Berkeley going into a Nimbus US5 headphone amplifier. That's like, what, $12,000, $13,000 worth of gear signal chain there? It's tough being me. Okay. Um, I plugged both of these into that 
uh, system and I thought the mid-range, okay, which was already like more lush and full and organic on the 6XX over the R70X on like more pr price appropriate gear, stepped forward a little bit more in terms of its organicness and its natural sound. And then I think the resolution of the 6XX, like the resolution ceiling, what it's truly capable of was just a little bit higher than what the Refine was capable of doing there on that just ridiculous for these headphones um, signal chain. And I should mention before I go here on this comparison, the 6XX is best suited for music genres like rock, metal, pop, EDM, hip hop. That's my opinion on that. Others can disagree, but that's where I think it, its music genres are most at home. The R70X is very much a generalist on music. Um, rock, pop, metal, hip hop, EDM, classical, jazz, whatever. They all sounded pretty good on this one. This one, I definitely prefer the rock, metal, pop, EDM, hip hop kinds of music on here. So that's another contrast between the two of these here as well. Okay, so quickly wrapping it up then the, the comparison between these two. They are both great for tube amps. I should have said that off the top because 300 ohm dynamic, 470 ohm dynamic. If you have an OTL tube amp, they are both great for that. The 6XX transforms on a tube amp in the way that the Refine does not. Okay, I think I've mentioned this already. The Refine sounds basically the same, whether it's on a solid state amp or a tube amp. It just, the higher impedance allows it to be compatible with tube amps in a way that a lot of headphones are not. Okay, but it does not transform like the 6XX often does. That said, the 6XX's sound is not for everyone. The spatial presentation can be a little too intimate and not very holographic for a lot of folks. Uh, the lack of treble extension and presence on this one can be an issue for some. And then if you've heard this, the phrase Sennheiser Veil and it bothers you, that is present here and it is not on the R70X. So the R70X does a good job of maintaining a lot of the warmth of this one while giving you a little bit more treble presence and all of that and definitely more spatial holography. It's not quite as resolving um, in the top end, I think on most price appropriate amps, you're not going to notice the resolution difference between these two. Only in the really extreme set situation that no one should make their permanent setup, in my humble yet correct opinion, did the uh, resolution difference of the 6XX come forward a little bit. Okay, but again, the R70X is really a nice viable alternative to the 6XX without breaking the bank, being compatible with tube amps, still being warm and punchy and more holographic and giving you more treble presence than this one does. So like it definitely has its own place uh, in the market because of that. All right, the other German legend that I have on hand to compare the Refine with is the Biodynamic DT880. This is the 600 ohm edition. I have personally dual uh, or modded the cabling so it can do dual 3.5 millimeter. Um, that's why it doesn't have the attached cable. So that if in stock form is already one disadvantage. This one has a permanently attached cable and my misgivings about the cabling system on the Refine aside, it is at least detachable and you can buy aftermarket cables for it if you want. Okay. This headphone right now is about 175 US dollars, at least according to Buyer Dynamics website. Okay, um, it's also a 600 ohm, as I said, it's a 600 ohm dynamic driver headphone in it. It is tuned very differently than this. This one is definitely neutral bright with a lot more treble energy and all of that. It also has excellent bass extension, but the bass is just lean, okay? They are pretty close to each other in terms of impactfulness in the low end. So like when this one does hit, it hits just about as well as this one. It's just that the bass presence is far leaner on the DT880 than the R70X. What the buyer does is like, what you were just talking about, what the HD6XX slash 650 does for mid-range is what the buyer does for treble on the right signal chains. This one is very signal chain picky. The R70X is much more of a signal chain generalist. But when you get this one dialed in on the right signal chain, its treble in particular can just sound shockingly lifelike. OK, 
Okay, I don't know how they did it, but it is just really amazing how they are able to get this level of treble timbre and clarity and detail out of this under $200 headphone. But again, right signal chain and tracks okay, on there as well. But because of those tuning differences, the DT880 I find to be more well suited to classical and jazz and other kinds of highly acoustic kinds of music. It gets a little bit grating and fatiguing on a lot of rock, metal, hip hop, EDM kinds of stuff. The Refine, again, is very much a music generalist. Basically, all genres of music sound good to great on this thing, where, again, we're getting into a little bit more specialization here on the DT-880, right? So, I mean, wrapping all of that kind of up quickly and putting a bow on it here, bright, much brighter sound, a lot of signal chain pickiness, warmer sound, not much signal chain pickiness, music generalist, music specif specialist. I almost said specificitist. I don't think that's a word, okay? But, okay, uh, music specialist here, classical jazz, like that sort of thing. Um, they are similar in their drive, 470 ohms, 600 ohms. Like they have very similar amp requirements in terms of power output. They are both tube amp friendly because of that high impedance, okay, and that sort of thing. The DT880, though much like the 6XX, will scale up higher. Same signal chain that I mentioned earlier with the Berkeley and the uh, and the Nimbus amp and all of that. Like the treble on this just seems to keep getting more and more natural and real sounding and resolving. And the spatial holography on this just keeps getting more and more three dimensional and convincing. This one does not quite reach up as high as that. Okay. But where this one often gets fatiguing and all that, this is a nice and relaxed and like long listening kind of situations, more friendly with more music genres and more signal chains than the DT880 is. So, you know, pros and cons here too. Hi-Fi Man Edition XS. I am used to this being a $500 headphone, but lately Hi-Fi Man has been selling it for about $260, $270 US dollars, right around in there. It's one of those two. Um, that is a ridiculously good deal for this headphone. And it's something you need to consider if you're gonna think about dropping $300 on the Refine uh, and waiting a while to get it. There are still reasons that you might get the Refine over the XS though. The XS is gonna have like a slightly V-shaped signature in comparison. So it's got like the warmth and the fullness to its sound like the set the R70X has, but it also has more treble presence. And it's gonna to be too much for some. It's gonna to be too bright and too fatiguing and too sharp in the treble for some, whereas this one is more forgiving in the top end than the XS. The XS is also gonna be far more physical. It's gonna slam, it's gonna hit in a way that the R70X does not. But another big concern with the X, well, and I should also say resolution on um, price appropriate gear, the XS is gonna be more resolving and more holographic and three dimensional and just sound bigger in its spatial presentation because it's got those big egg shaped planar magnetic drivers in it. Okay, oh well, the drivers are not egg shaped, but it's got the egg shaped cups with the big planar drivers in there. Okay. But there are other concerns here. This headband on this headphone, not great. Comfort issues on the Edition XS for a lot of people. Okay, hot spotting up here at the top of the head. That's something to be aware of. This is not tube amp friendly, this one is. And then this one, the treble can be a little bit too much and get too fatiguing for some, particularly if you like a lot of rock, metal, hip hop, pop, EDM kinds of stuff that can be brightly recorded and a little bit hot in the treble sometimes, okay? But in terms of raw performance, the Edition XS is the higher performer, but there are still reasons why you might be rightly tempted to get this one over the Edition XS, and hopefully I have spelled those out here. Wrapping all of this up then, what are my general takeaways and recommendations for the R70X? 
Uh, it is a good sounding headphone with a slightly warm tilt to its overall tonality. It has decent resolution and spatial holography and dynamic impact, particularly in the low end for a headphone of its price. It is a music genre generalist. It is very comfortable. It has a non-fatiguing sound, so it's something that you can just plug in, shuffle a bunch of music together, and just listen all day long. And so that is a strength. It sounds different enough from other hi z offerings at its price point, like the HD6XX and the DT880-600 ohm as just two examples, to stand on its own, and it offers the level of technical performance to be worthy of the $300 price tag in there. So it does have a lot going for it in terms of sonics and comfort. I don't like the cabling system personally. I think it just it's a puzzling design to me that is also a little bit wasteful in terms of using extra conductors that you don't need, which can have an antenna effect and all of that. I just don't know why they did that in that way. I would not have made that choice. But that said, I don't think the cabling issue is going to be a reason to not buy this headphone. It was not a reason for many to not buy the original R70X either. It's just a personal gripe that I have that may or may not be a deal breaker for you. So can I recommend this headphone like from a price to performance and sonic standpoint? Yes, I can. The thing that you are gonna have to factor in on top of this and the question that I cannot answer for you is are you in a position to wait up until May of 2025 to get this thing on your head? And that is gonna be an individual calculus and decision that you make that I just can't tell you what to do on other than to say sonically and price to performance wise, I think they have a good product here. All right, so I am Wave Theory. Thanks for watching my review of the APOS and audio technical collaboration known as the ATH R70X Refine. Please remember to like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, check out my PayPal and my Patreon, and generally do those things you do to support YouTube channels. And as always, enjoy the music.